2% of tech jobs at Google. And so every year it's like, well, why is it still disappointing? Like what's going on? So I wanted to look under the hood to kind of figure out why has diversity been this obsession in America throughout my entire career, both in daily journalism and then later in higher ed, where I've been for more than 25 years. Right. And yet it's the exact same conversation today that was had when I started, you know, as a professor and when I started as a daily journalist. And it's right. like, why are we having the same conversation and yet the needle is not Nothing moving. has changed really. Not right. Really. And right. in some fields, it's even gotten worse. Like there are right. fewer black journalists working in daily journalism today than when I was a daily journalist, you know, um, more than 20 years ago. So right. I wanted to kind of interrogate that tension between the, the all the rhetoric around diversity, the, mm -hmm. the kind of prominence in the workspace of these chief diversity officers and the billions of dollars that are devoted to diversity every year and right. the lack of diversity. Like, right. so what's going on? So that that's that was sort of the uh, jumping off point for right. research. Yeah, and did you feel do you feel like you've come with some clear understanding of why we have stayed yeah. sort of stuck in? Yeah, I I, I kind of do. I mean, I you know, um, if there are some takeaways, you know, one is that um, first of all, you know, we're trying to insert these diversity initiatives into this toxic ecosystem mm -hmm. where you still have these embedded ideas around race and about yeah. African inferiority, European right. superiority, like that is still baked into right. our curriculum. It's baked into our iconography. Like just this past year, right. Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben were retired from boxes, right? <laughs> no, right. Where, they, where they were these iconic symbols of right. Black servitude. Um, you know, we're just beginning to see Confederate monuments fall, you know. Um, we're just beginning to like retire offensive names of a, you know, like a NFL team. Um, Princeton mm -hmm. just renamed a school that was named for some, their school of public policy, no less, that right. was named for Woodrow Wilson, who during his lifetime was far more extremely racist than most people of his generation. So you can't even like say, well, it was just the times. It's the times, right. He was extremely right. So all of, so this kind of reckoning is just beginning to happen now in 2020. So it's no surprise that with, in this kind of environment, you're not going to have a lot of diversity because you have these embedded ideas about right. who people are and what they're capable of, right? Yeah. But then you also have, um, you know, as we just mentioned, the, the, the emphasis has been on anti-bias training instead right. of on hiring people of color. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. Just make you do it. Just do it. It's like if you <laughs> just did that instead of you, instead there's this whole project to change hearts right. and minds. But you know, it it if it worked, then we'd see the needle move. But right. worse work. than that, there there have now been conclusive studies that show not only does anti-bias training not work, it often makes the problem worse right. by stoking resentment, fueling right. a backlash in the workplace. Right. And five years after mandatory training, the percentage of black women in management and Asian men and women in management actually drops. Right. So, you it know- It actually has, is counterproductive. It's really. counterproductive. Yeah. It, it, doing more harm than good. And yet companies continue to do the exact same thing. And it's, easy, it's, 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 our, it's packaged. It's, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, like it's easy. It's like, it's like what um, one of the civil rights lawyers I interviewed, Sarah, Cyrus Murray, who litigated um, the successful lawsuit, discrimination lawsuit against Coca-Cola, he calls it drive-by diversity. You know, it's like, you know, you just drive by, you do your training. Yeah, you check that box. Did it, you know. Yeah. And so th those are two of the biggest reasons. And then, 
you know, people, it, it's also our, our culture, it, uh, customs. Um, we live in a rigidly segregated nation. And yeah. so who gets hired? People hire who they know. They hire yeah. who their friends know. They hire, you know, from a grapevine. Well, if people of color are left out of that grapevine, then what we have are self-replicating right. work. So these social spheres are replicated in workplaces that are homogenous. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so you have these things that become just baked into, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the lack of diversity, all which could be disrupted at any point. And mm -hmm. then one of the fourth uh, reasons why we haven't seen more diversity is the lack of leadership around this. Yeah. Um, you know, oftentimes um, CEOs and university presidents, they farm yeah. it out. They farm out this problem to a yeah. diversity officer or to a consultant who is marginalized within the- The whole university or whatever, yeah. Right, and okay. so these people, the, the, these most marginalized of, of you know, the executives in, in these institutions are not given the resources or the support mm -hmm. to do the job that they need to do. So. It, it seems like it's enough just to put them there and uh -huh. to say, this is our commitment to diversity. But there was a study that came, a survey of chief diversity officers at Fortune 500 companies last year that showed that only 35% even had access to the company metrics that would allow them to see where they metastasize and unequal pay and unequal opportunity, promotions, bonuses, you know, candidate pools. Without that kind of information, right, the transparent metrics, they're shooting in the dark. What can they even do? If you can't assess the problem, you certainly can't fix it. Can't point so, out. You know, all of these things that have conspired um, to keep us in this place where we can continue to talk about diversity, throw money at diversity, but never have to actually achieve diversity. Yeah. I mean, I think in your book, it was really clear when there were people who, that those, uh, those rare cases of, of leadership that kind of just suddenly moved, the, just changed the whole conversation. Exactly. It does because, really take that person at the top, the very top that says, this is going to happen now. Yes, because that's what it takes. It's, it's, I mean, it comes down to being a leadership problem without mm -hmm. leadership. Um, no, no amount of strategies, you know, the, you right. could have the best tactics, but without the leadership, the support of the yeah. entire institution, it's, you're never going to be able to actually um, make yeah. the strides that, and, and the comp, and the, the, the example, one of the examples that I do a deep dive on is the Coca-Cola company. That's right, that story. Now, they began yeah. to turn it around, um, after they were sued for discrimination and they had a settlement right. and they put systems in place that allowed them to first detect patterns of bias along race and gender lines and then to disrupt those patterns in real yeah. time so they yeah. could see uh, if yeah. you know before job offer uh, was finalized you know what did the candidate pool look like How, yeah. what are the salaries in line along racial lines or along right. gender lines? So after doing this for over a five-year period, they were able to substantially increase the diversity mm -hmm. of the work. Yeah, I talk a little bit about the Rooney rule. I thought that was interesting. And I, I always think it's interesting to look at the NFL because in a weird way, it's quite a socialist organization. <laughs> right. And it's, and it's always thought of when, when we think yeah. of Sports, you think of that's a level playing field. That's where yeah. only talent matters, right? Right, right, right. So you have a league that's about 70% black when you look at players, but you had leadership that was like white, 90 something percent white. Right. And so that imbalance um, is what um, the lawyer I mentioned, Cyrus Murray, and um, the late Johnny Cochran, who mm -hmm. became pretty famous yeah. for his. Uh, his defense of yeah. Jay Simpson. Um, 
-hmm. So they they did a study looking at um, you know race in the NFL and you know team ownership. They were kind of compelled to do it, right? Because there was a little bit of um, suddenly there was almost going to be no black coaches, right? Or there had been right. right they because yet another black coach. They I think they had only gotten up to like three in in the history of the NFL and right. and was fired and so they wanted to look at the records of these these black coaches compare them to the records of the white coaches and they found more successful black coaches still lost their jobs <laughs> than less successful right. white ones and anyway they did this study and it and it got a lot of attention and yeah. then um, the league came up with this this rule that required every team uh, um, to in the in the the team owners had to agree to this because the league can't really right. and, make anything happen. Right. Right. Okay. So the they, the teams. Yeah. right. So they agreed that um, for any front office job or, you know, coach or like anything like that, um, they would have to at least have a diverse candidate pool. And it worked for a while and they, they got up to like 25% of coaches of color and, mm -hmm. um, and then they took their eyes off the ball, no pun intended, and then it slipped back down. And I think now it's back down to, to two or yeah. three. But it, you know, all of these things, you can come up with the tactics, right. but without the will, intention, right. and leadership and, yeah. and vigilance to, to, you know, you have to keep it going. Like it's not a one and done. Like you, this yeah. is something that you, it's a, a field that you have to continue, right? right. To, to, and in a way, I mean, I think this book is right at the moment. And I was wondering, because, you know, this year with Black Lives Matter, with the, you know, the terrible video things we have seen that, you know, right. yeah, all of that is, that's, perhaps, what do you think? Do you feel like that might change things? That Colin pa Kaepernick, all of this stuff, is it, has it? Well, um, I know it, it's, probably why my book has gotten so much more attention right. um, and and you know after George Floyd I don't think anyone can can any longer honestly claim that there's no race problem right you know that we're post-race and that you know and I think people are looking beyond um, policing to look at other ways that mm -hmm. racial injustice is being expressed in American life. And so my book is showing how it's being expressed in the workplace. Right. You know, Michelle Alexander had a book that showed how it was expressed in the prison industrial the uh, complex. Right, right, right. So right. like th there are all of these prisms through mm -hmm. which you can find, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, compelling um, evidence of, of racial injustice. And, you know, what I say in, in Diversity Inc. is that in, in, in the U.S., we kind of have normalized this injustice. We yeah. normalize that fields like law are, are still so overwhelmingly white and male, yeah. despite the, the, you know, the legions of people of color who go to the top, who've graduated from the top law schools where you still have um, law partnerships are only 1.8% um, Black, and they move from like 1.7% a decade ago, <laughs> it's right, like, right, right, right. It's you know, weird. or to look at why you know fields, journalism, museums, Hollywood, Hollywood. Yeah. You Hollywood. know, that, that was a very good chapter, actually, the one on Hollywood. Yeah, I because how yeah, bad it was. Right, because it, it, and the thing that was um, very surprising to me, beyond just how bad the numbers were across the board, mm -hmm. is that the fields that are considered the most progressive. Yeah. The least diverse. Yeah, I right? thought that was really interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. like, who, who would think that corporate America was far ahead of Hollywood when right. it came to diversity? Well, corporate America seems to be far ahead of higher education as well. And higher education and fashion and <laughs> yeah. museums and Museum world, yeah. so many of these like so-called progressive, you know, right. the creative fields are the least diverse because mm -hmm. I think that is, they are also among the most elite. Mm -hmm. And so they pride themselves on like this kind of elitism 
where they can pick and choose like their small mm -hmm. numbers of positions and that they can right. like, you know, hold it tight where right. corporate America has to cast a wide net, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have so many positions to fill right. where in these smaller, more boutique kind of operations, they can, they can have nepotism. They right. can, right. It's, and it's sort of hidden. Nobody quite knows who got hit, why. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And the thing is, it like in the field like Hollywood, you do know, like you see whole families who are in the business, <laughs> like, you know, yeah. generation after generation, it's held, it's held yeah. very, very tightly. So, yeah. um, so not surprisingly, you know, despite, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that people of color, like 40% of the population, they hold less than 10% of any of the top tier positions in Hollywood, you know, directors or studio executives, or, you know, no matter right. where you look, they're, they're acutely underrepresented. And so and again, when those, those films started to be made, getting made, it was when there was someone at the, like someone like Spike Lee who could green light a program. Who, right. you know, say, That's what's going to happen now. Yeah. Have right. Have someone there. Yeah. Right. There's right. A question so, here. Um, that's, are any, are there any effective bias training programs in your opinion? Is it possible to improve them or do you think they should be abandoned altogether? You know, I, I, I hesitate to say this, like, the problem is not just that the anti-bias programs don't work mm -hmm. and they don't. Like we have now 50 years of <laughs> Yeah, it's like we have 50 years. Like it's no longer like a new thing where we don't, right, right. we'll wait and see. Yeah. We have 50 years that basically show it doesn't work. And, and at best it works uh, for a day or two, mm -hmm. but at worst, it, puts people like back. it makes it's the crazy. problem worse. And even in the cases where it can change minds or attitude for a day or two, it still fuels resentment in the workplace. So I've never seen it done in a way that did not do that. Mm -hmm. And is that the point? Like, is what is the goal? If the goal is to increase right. diversity, why are we not focusing on increasing diversity, looking at broadening out our networks that we're tapping. hiring hiring people of color yeah hiring people of color what a novel idea <laughs> <laughs> like oh you want that but no first you have to train you have to change your whole way of thinking <laughs> and and the thing too when is if you began to hire more people of color that would, you would change hearts and minds in a more organic way. Okay. It's the lack of exposure to people of color it, that has, you know, has people thinking that these people are the stereotype that they've seen in film right. and news. And the, it's right. being exposed to difference is the best way to educate Absolutely. people about difference. And Actually, so I think that's a point that, that, come, that speaks a little bit to what you were saying earlier, because in the North, like in sort of, for example, publishing or these like elite places a lot in the Northeast, there's, there are less, they're less exposed to, to people of color in their lives, whereas down in the South, right. people are up together. So it's, it's interesting, you know, there's almost- Exactly, less so there's more of a comfort level. I mean, I've been to so many events in this city, literary events, mm -hmm. book parties, right. public, you know, pub, and I could be in a room with a hundred people and be the only person of color in the room unless we count the wait staff. Right. And this is- <laughs> so normal in New York right. and one of the most diverse cities on the planet right. where I could just so often be the only person right. of in the room and there's not even any self-consciousness about right. it. Right. No, they don't, no one else notices it. You might notice it. No. But, right. <laughs> so I'm always struck. It's like, wow, look at this room. And people are like, what? What? <laughs> and maybe what they're thinking is like, wow, this is a diverse room. She's here. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just such a normal thing, right, right. even in these, like, like just crazy diverse cities like New right. York and, and Chicago and like you could be in all of these places and still manage to have these very like elite insular groups. Places. Yeah, and it's and and you cannot attribute it to education any longer. You mm -hmm. can't attribute it to a, a pipeline. You can, mm -hmm. it's all about 
what people view as elite, who belongs in an elite setting, and yeah. who doesn't. And, yeah, really, yeah. and so those kind of um, cultural shifts need yeah. to happen way before you get to the workplace. It's not going to work there. Like yeah. that is where we need to look at our curricular to, to see how these ideas are being uh-huh. formed, right? Uh-huh. And, and nurtured. And then they, 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 they fully flower and, and into these homogenous spaces that no one feels is a problem. Uh-huh. I mean, I think your book does do a good job of showing how complex how the different, I mean, it's all these different levels, you know, um, right. like you were saying earlier, you have, we have the iconography, we have, you know, we have these institutional, we have just this, these normative, it's, right. it's, it's structural racism. <laughs> and, we have, and we have Hollywood, right? Yeah. We have Hollywood. Hollywood that has for, for more than a century perpetuated the worst stereotypes about people of color. And that, 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 uh-huh. that are, you know, disseminated throughout the world. Yeah. So, you know, and then if you look at who's making those films and who's not in the room, <laughs> it's it, it white guys. <laughs> right. It, it helps explain how how these you know how these attitudes continue yeah. to 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 fester. So I, yeah, I, so I, those kind of things you're not going to be able to arrest that in a training session. Like right. it's so deeply embedded in our culture, that's going to take so much more time. But while that's not happening, the training program is not going to work either. What right. needs to work is you need to hire a more diverse workplace. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask, this is sort of a depressing question. Um, how do you, because I, how do you feel about, I mean, I heard some incredible statistics about COVID disproportionately. Oh my God. Yeah. African-Americans in America, African-Americans, um, especially in terms of unemployment numbers. Yeah. where there's been some of the economy has recovered, but what, what is recovered basically is white men. Right. And, and because people who are being right. left behind are women and, and black. Right, because African-Americans and Latinos are overrepresented in the frontline kind of mm-hmm. fields, right? The, mm-hmm. right? You know, they work in hospitals and they work in grocery stores and they work in, you know, so they, they hold many of those, those uh, frontline positions that have put them um, at, at, you know, they're, they're yeah, more exposed to it. And um, yeah, you know, and who gets to, who gets to work remotely, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, who gets to turn on their computer from the safety of their homes and mm-hmm. still get a, a, get a nice paycheck. Uh-huh. So, you know, it goes back to diversity and, where people are clustered, where they're overrepresented, where they're underrepresented, and you know, yeah, it's, well, it's I mean, I, I, inter inter time, all, right? all a piece. Yeah, right. I, I know my sister's a school teacher, and they're doing, um, you know, she's a it's a high school, so teaching from uh, from home, and the just the, you know the students that don't have computers or don't have access versus I, those. I, yeah, like we take you know, Wi-Fi for granted. Kids are, yeah, it's, it's a huge right. difference. You know. Yeah. Kids who are doing the whole math course on their, their mother's cell phone. Right. And then, you know, you think of, you know, the formative years and right. kids who are already in these under-resourced schools and how much longer, it, you know, the, just how, how much more devastating the impact of this disruption mm-hmm. has been. Yeah. But the book does offer some guidelines. I'm gonna, yes, you know, it's not all depressing. <laughs> <laughs> you do outline at the end what people what we can do this it's quite concrete in terms of um what corporate what different institutions can do what, what steps they can take yeah um and was that that you talk about ideal this this how did you come upon that is this is that the name of the group oh or? working ideal yeah yeah, well, that's again, that's that's that civil rights attorney, um, Cyrus Murray. He he's litigated like the the biggest landmark discrimination lawsuits in this country. Uh huh. He also has a company that trains that that creates systems to disrupt right. um, um, bias in the workplace. Uh-huh. And so, um, for the paperback, um, you know, I was. I wanted to add an appendix with just some more hands-on things. Uh-huh. And 
and I was interviewing him and, and oh. the, some others. And I said, why don't you just put together, do you have something that you can put together like a little toolkit oh. that, that uh, people can walk away with? So that's how that came about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, tell me how the book has been going since it's come out. You've had sort of a... Well, it came out, it came out of the gate. Like I, I, you know, it's like the little engine that could, it came out of the gate with, um, I had an excerpt in Time Magazine uh-huh. in the Guardian and in the Chronicle of Higher Education. So that was the first week out, out of the gate. Uh-huh. And then it quickly picked up steam. And then um, of course, George Floyd and, and, you know, that horrific tragedy. And ever since it's like, it's, I'm in some media outlet almost every day now. Um, I heard you on the BBC. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, so NPR, BBC. Ooh, good, good for you, yay. Yeah. yeah, so I'm just hoping because at some point I don't want to talk about diversity anymore because as you know, I'm a journalist and I yeah. move on. I, like, yeah. the, like there are people who work in this field right. that's what they do all day, every day. Right. Talk this to them. is not what I will talk about next year. Right. I can stop talking about it <laughs> this year. So, right. but you know, um, it's really gratifying. Um, yeah. you know, I'm named it as one of the must-read books of 2019, right. which, which was really nice. And yeah. you know, so it it's it's done what I wanted it to do. Yeah. It um because I wrote it because I'm tired of the same conversation. Like yeah. how do we get past this right. so that at least we can have a different kind of conversation? And I think, um, you know, pe- more people listened than I expected them right. to. Cause I really wrote it for like, so I never have to talk about it right. again. Right. I, you know, I remember you and I talking about your first book, or not your first book, but the book that you wrote, the first book you wrote it, or worked on while you were drawing more, right. the Oda Banga book, mm-hmm. and, and how you felt while you were writing it, that it was kind of this magical experience, because every time, you know, you would, you'd be yeah. going down one path, and the things would happen, just fall into your lap, and it was mm-hmm. this book you had to write, and it was up until the end that way. Oh, and, and, and you know that um, the Bronx Zoo finally apologized. Yes, I saw that. I met, I wanted to write you an email. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So finally, like five years after my book came out, they they had refused to, um, you know, interview requests from every news organization that contacted them after my book came out. And so finally, finally, this past summer, they they apologized. I wonder what it was. Maybe it was your book. I think it was that. No, I, well, it was five years after my book. I think it, it was uh, George Floyd. Floyd. It was when all of these, uh, you know, they were like, oh, yeah. The EO was saying Black Lives Matter. Right, you right. know, I think, I think the George Floyd um, incident was a wake up call for many, right. many in, in white America who, mm-hmm. I, who just oh, really. Yeah. Ex- explain the question. Actually, sorry, because for our listeners, some of them don't understand what this book was about, Oda Benga. Maybe quickly explain, because what oh, did the Bronx yeah. Zoo apologize for? Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so, yeah, so in, in 1906, a young um, African, um, and I think he was a teenager, who had been captured in the Congo, was exhibited in the Bronx Zoo monkey house with an orangutan. And it became one of the biggest... Um, you know, exhibits in New York, like tens of thousands of people flocked to the zoo to see this exhibit. It was written about all over the country and in Europe. And um, it, so that's what the book is about. And, and it looks at um, how it was that Oda Benga was brought to the United States. He was first brought here in 1904 to exhibit at the St. Louis World's Fair. And then two years later, he was at the um, at the Bronx Zoo. So I went into the archives to 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 trace his footsteps and all of the things that transpired um, between the time he was captured in the Congo um, to the time he he died in in um, 1916. But what the book really was was a historical corrective because um, there had been a book written by the grandson of the man who captured Odebanger in 
in the Congo who had written articles about how he captured him in the Congo. <laughs> and later his grandson wrote a book about the friendship between his grandfather and Odebenga. And I found that kind of hard to believe that <laughs> he was his friend because yeah. why was only Odebenga in a monkey house and he wasn't. <laughs> and so I just wanted to see, well, how do we, his book had no citations, no documentation. So I, I went into the uh, archives first at the Bronx Zoo to see if there was any way to, to find evidence of what actually happened. And what I found was so jaw dropping um, and shocking. Um, and, and then I began to do archival research all over the country and finally was able to actually almost, I almost had um, some evidence of what happened to him pretty much every day from the time he was captured in the Congo through uh, his movement through Europe and then um, across the United States. And, and then there was, just, there, there was just much more than I could have anticipated um, that, that I was able to find. It's, it's a very powerful book um, and tragic. Um, but what I was thinking about was how you, that, that experience of writing that book you felt was almost like you were being led yeah, that, yeah, because it was so hard at first to find, um, you know, documentation and, um, but then after a while of digging and digging and digging, things started like falling out falling of place. Right. I felt like Oda Banger was like saying, look over there, look yeah, over him. there. And I was just finding more than I ever could have anticipated. I mean, I, I found him in ship passenger records. I found him in census data. I found him in the letters of anthropologists who were writing from the Congo to their mother and they came across Odebanga. I felt like I just, I just kept finding him. And then um, right as I was writing uh, um, the epilogue, one thing that I could not find is that there had been a, a, a cast made of him uh, while he was at the St. Louis World's Fair. It was a plaster cast of his, you know, a bust. Down, right. a bust. And, um, and I, I couldn't find it. I knew that the, the Museum of Natural History had commissioned it. And oh. like, I knew a lot about it, but they claimed they didn't, they don't know anything about a cast. They know nothing about a bust. <laughs> and I was going to visit my daughter Mother's Day weekend and uh, I was working on the epilogue and as I was about to go up to Dartmouth and I was like, there was a show at Dartmouth on Odebenga. Let me see what the show was about. The, this artist had taken things out of their warehouse to, to display. And one of the things in his show was the plastic cast yes. at Dartmouth. <laughs> it was like, ah! and, and not only, were they able to pull that out for me, but they had all of the acquisition uh, records and I could, like I found so much more about um, even not just Oda Banga, but the other Congolese who were also brought to the World's Fair. Like I had never seen pictures of them or anything and there were their casts. Um, wow. it, was, it was a pretty amazing experience yeah. and I was able to to get to, to fill that hole right before the book went to press. Did you have that same feeling with this book? No, it's a different kind of book uh, because uh, um, it, for, for spectacle, I was like tracing, I was like chasing a ghost. Yeah. I was looking for yeah. old manga, someone who didn't have his own papers. Right. Well, I had to find him like on the margins of history. I had right. to find him in newspaper accounts, in the letters of other people, in the, right. you know what right. I'm saying? He didn't, have, he didn't have his own voice. Right, and so I had to find it. I had to mm -hmm. find a way to make him real. And, right. you know, so it was a, so much, it, just a far greater challenge. I spent right. five years on that book right. where Diversity Inc., I think I did in like a year. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a much, it's, it's much, it's a whole different kind of exercise. Yeah, it's much truer to what I, I'm a journalist. I'm not really a historian. I was mm -hmm. just playing one for, <laughs> for <No, spectacle>. the <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where this is more journalistic is yeah, yeah. truer to what I, what I do. And do you have another project? 
if I could stop talking about diversity, I have some ideas, but I haven't uh -huh. had time to, to really uh, explore anything. So I'm hoping over the holiday break, I'll clear my head of diversity and, and be able to do my next project. Okay, good, because I'd love you to come back to Dormar. Oh, can I? Did you, did you hear it out there? <laughs> <laughs> um, is there? Are there any other questions? Because I think we're at 45 minutes, which is usually when we wrap it up. Um, which is, so if anyone else have a question, it's now or never. And then I think we'll, um, but you know, and you can type it in the chat if you want to. But, um, but in general, I can never figure out. Oh, here's one. Are, are, are there any states that have undertaken educational initiatives from elementary school onwards to educate kids and tackle racism? And do you think those work? Um, I, I'm, I'm beginning to hear about some initiatives that always highly controversial whenever you try to tackle you know um issues of race it's still the third rail in the united states as it is yes. other places i'm sure but um i i think what's what's happened since this summer is that there is now a greater acknowledgement of the need to tackle our our curriculum yeah. and to into I mean, even even that project that wonderful, uh, was it 1419? Uh, oh, 1619. 1619. Yeah. Here. Um, right. And that was so controversial. And then it went away. It's such a brilliant, yeah. yeah it's, right, right. So there's always resistance because people see it as sort of like airing dirty laundry or bringing back painful history. But if we don't examine our history, which kind of explains where we are, people will never understand why we still have this persistent inequity and, and, right. and the racial disparities. They think just people just don't care or people, right. like if we don't understand, if we don't examine the history, we'll never understand where we are and we'll continue to make the exact same mistakes that we've made in the past. And you know, so much of that is 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 to blame for where we are now. Why why we're not making the progress that you would expect um, us to make after I, all? I was going to ask you about the election, but I think I won't. <laughs> oh my God! What can we even say about it? Is it like it? It yeah. seems so. I mean, I think I have. I have to say, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh -huh. I have never seen such jubil jubilation in my life, but I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, which is probably one of the most progressive places on the planet. Uh -huh. But from the moment the news broke that they the election was called, I mean, people were yeah. beeping horns, dancing, singing in the streets. It was like a weekend cele <laughs> celebration. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, for a little while, I wished I was there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was something. But I heard in Paris, they were like ringing the, the, bells, the yeah. yeah, it's like, so, but then again, you know, there were 71 million people who voted for Trump, and they're not dancing. Yeah, away. So yeah. it's, it's still sad that, that the nation is that divided. Yeah, it is. And I think if you're right, that a lot of it is, goes back to these founding roots of, of slavery and uh, oppression. And, and right, the original that. sin in that, and some people just don't want to move away from that embedded ideology. Some people still believe it, but it's not difficult to understand why people believe it because it's been embraced by the top yeah. colleges and universities taught this kind of racial hierarchy up right. through the 60s and 70s, and you Absolutely. could still find echoes of it in, in, uh, in the curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna say thank you. I, let me just see if I've got everything. Um, and, and, you know, thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming. Next and um, it's always great to talk with you, Pamela. It's great to oh, see you. Such a pleasure. So thanks so much. Um, goodbye, everybody. Bye.